Hey everybody, we're going to be looking at some problems involving forces and their effect on the motion of objects. So it'll be handy to know some of the forces that we see frequently in these problems. The one that we'll see on almost every problem is going to be Fg, or the force of gravity. Now, the force of gravity is one that you're probably pretty familiar with. It makes you, uh, well, not fly off the earth. We appreciate that. Uh, the direction on this one is always going to be downward or more specifically toward the center of the earth. If we have a problem where downward doesn't make sense as a direction. Uh, and then we also have a way that we can calculate the magnitude of this force if we know the mass of some object that, uh, uh, that we're dealing with and we know that we're uh, on the earth and, and close to the surface. So the force of gravity acting on some object is going to be equal to the mass of that object times the acceleration due to gravity, or this can also be read as the, the gravitational field um, at that location. Now, here on Earth, this value for g is going to be 9.8 meters per second squared downward. And so if we know the mass of an object, and that needs to be in kilograms, if we know the mass of an object, we can simply multiply that mass by 9.8 meters per second squared uh, to get the magnitude for the net force, and that'll be in newtons. And the direction on that is always going to be downward. So a number of problems you might look at at, at the very beginning and think, well, I don't know how, uh, you know, how much uh, force is acting on this thing, so I don't know anything about that downward force, but and you see, oh, they give us a mass. So actually, I can figure out something about that downward force. So that's the force of gravity. Next up, one that we'll see again on almost every problem is going to be what we call the normal force. Fn is the normal force. Normal here meaning perpendicular. We call it the normal force. That's, again, a geometry term that means perpendicular. Uh, because it's always going to be perpendicular to a surface. That's the direction for this every time. Perpendicularly away from a surface. And that surface needs to be in contact with the object in question. All right, so maybe we imagine uh, a box sitting on the floor here. We'd have a couple of forces on this one. We'd have a gravitational force downward, Fg, and we'd have a normal force upward. Now, as long as the box is sitting at rest there, uh, that and uh, or I guess is not accelerating anyway, those two forces would be equal to each other. They don't have to be equal to each other, though. Say I give it a, an extra uh, push downward, uh, then that uh, normal force would get larger as well. So I might have a couple of downward forces, and then the normal force has to balance that out. Or if I lift up that on that box a little bit, then the normal force is going to get a little, a little bit smaller in that case. Uh, so the normal force and the gravitational force, we find in many problems will have the same magnitude, but there's no rule that they have to have the same magnitude. And of course, if we have, say, a wall instead of a, uh, a horizontal surface, uh, maybe we're pushing up against the wall here with some applied force, we'd have a normal force acting on this that keeps it from falling through that wall, and there's absolutely nothing connecting that to the, the size of the gravitational force. They aren't even in the same direction here. So normal force is going to be away from any surface that, uh, that our object is touching. It's a consequence of the electric interaction between the electrons in our object in question and the electrons in the surface that we're, uh, we're in contact with. So that's normal force. Again, you see that on almost every problem. Uh, another common one is going to be tension. That'll be Ft. So that's the force of tension something we see in any problem where we have a rope or a cable. So this is the force that's in a rope or a cable. The direction on this direction is going to be uh, along the direction of the rope or cable. 
So, along the direction here, uh, more specifically, we can say that this is always going to be a pulling force. We pull along the direction of a rope or a cable. So if you imagine having uh, an object here and we uh, tie some rope to it and the rope goes over this direction, that rope can only pull this object over this direction. I can't be standing on the end over here holding onto the rope and get this thing to move up this direction. And it doesn't work that way. I can pull on the rope, but it's not a rigid structure, so I can't apply a, a force in that direction. Uh, tension force. One thing we can say about this is that it's going to be the same all the way along the rope. So if there's a certain amount of tension in this rope, that means that, uh, that this object is getting a force this direction, and then the person pulling it, they're, getting, they're feeling a force in this direction, and those two forces would be equal to each other, so we'd use the same variable on those two. The directions don't have to be the same, but the, uh, the magnitudes are going to be the same. Uh, ropes we can think of as, as being carriers of force or transmitters of force. So when, uh, uh, when this person pulls on that rope, you know, this object, whatever that is, uh, that gets pulled on as a result of that. The person isn't touching the rope, they're not interacting with the rope directly, but that's the net effect, is that they have some impact on the rope. All right, and then last up, we've got friction. And friction, we have a few different versions of. So F with a subscript F, that's going to be friction. And we'll get into a little bit more detail with friction later on. So for now, what we need to know here is that the direction on this is always going to be in a direction that opposes the sliding of two surfaces past one another. Sliding of two surfaces past one another. So uh, oftentimes you hear friction um, described as opposing motion. Uh, I don't think that's a, a great way to describe it. So if we have, say, a, a rectangle here, <laughs> rectangle-ish, and then another object here, and let's say this one is sliding over this direction. It has some velocity v over to the right there. Um, friction tries to get these two slide, uh, to not slide past each other anymore. So if the bottom one isn't sliding, um, and the top one is, uh, the bottom one isn't moving, it's stationary, and the top one is moving to the right, that means these surfaces are sliding past each other. Uh, now that can be resolved, and friction is trying to resolve this, uh, it can be resolved in two ways. Either the bottom one can start to move over this direction, and so it gets a frictional force over this way, or the top one can stop sliding, and so it's going to get a frictional force over this direction. And those two forces are going to be equal in size, opposite in direction. Those two are a Newton's third law pair of forces. Uh, so friction tries to get these things to stop sliding past each other, but it might do that by stopping motion of one object or by starting motion of another object, or perhaps just by trying to change the motion of two separate objects. But those two forces do have to be equal in size and opposite in direction, as uh, Newton's third law would, would attest here. Now, the magnitude of that force is going to depend on two factors. Uh, it'll depend on the roughness of the surfaces. And that's described in a value that we label mu, called the coefficient of friction. Uh, it also depends on how hard we're squeezing those surfaces together. Um, now, we can have a variety of different forces squeezing these two together. As long as they don't pass through each other, then the amount of force squeezing them together and the amount of force keeping them from being squeezed together have to be exactly the same. And so instead of thinking of all the forces that might try to push these two together, we think of the one force that keeps these things from falling through each other which is the normal force. So the total of all the, uh, uh, all the forces trying to push these together and the normal force have to be the same size. So uh, friction depends on those two factors. 
the roughness of each of these surfaces and the normal force between them. Now, uh, a common demonstration of friction is rubbing your hands together. And that second point you can get pretty clearly here. If you push your hands together harder, it is harder to rub them past each other. You also feel a lot more uh, heat generated. We'll get into that when we talk about energy later on. The roughness of the surfaces, you probably don't want to test this that way because, I don't know, that'd be like putting sandpaper on one of your hands and then rubbing, and that just seems ugh, uncomfortable. So don't test it out that way. Now, once we've identified forces, our next step is to draw what we call a free body diagram. This is just a very simple picture that shows our object as just a dot, and then any force that's acting on it, let's say maybe we have a box sitting at rest on a floor, so it has a normal force upward, and it has a gravitational force downward. Any force acting on that object is shown as an arrow. We try to be careful about the size of the arrows too, so if these forces are the same size, the arrows ought to be the same size. Uh, so let's imagine say an object uh, box on a ramp here. And we have some angle theta for the ramp. Uh, and let's say that this box is just sitting there. It's not sliding down the ramp. It's just sitting there. So what forces might we have on this one? Well, assuming that it's on Earth, which is a pretty good assumption. I feel like someone would mention if, uh, oh, you know, by the way, we're not on Earth while we're doing this. That seems like a big enough deal to mention. Assuming we're on Earth, or some planet anyway, we're going to have a gravitational force downward. Uh, let's see, no ropes in this one, so I don't think there's going to be a tension force here. Uh, it is in contact with the surface, so we're, we are going to have a normal force, not straight up. Remember, the direction of normal force isn't upward, it's perpendicular to the surface. So here's our surface. We need to go perpendicularly away from that surface. So somewhere in this direction. All right, and uh, the box is on a ramp. Shouldn't it be sliding down the ramp? Well, it's not sliding down the ramp. That indicates to me that there must be friction present. Now I think about the direction of friction on this one. I know it's going to be either up the ramp or down the ramp. It's trying to prevent these two surfaces from sliding past each other. It's got to be parallel to those surfaces. So let's think about this. That box, if there were no friction, it would be sliding down the ramp. And so the fact that it's not sliding down the ramp tells me there must be a frictional force going back up the ramp. Once we're able to identify forces in a situation and draw out a free body diagram, that's where we start making calculations with these, and we can throw in all sorts of extra physics pieces from kinematics that we started with to things like work and energy, uh, momentum, uh, conservation of energy, uh, rotation. There's all these different areas of physics that open up to us once we can clearly figure out what forces are acting on an object and which directions they are acting.